Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you want to go ahead and stay on mute for now, um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Celeste King. I am the Director of People Ops at Open House Austin. Um, I'm so excited y'all are here. We are thrilled to be um, having this event with Krista and Jonathan. Um, we like to do these sort of free community events every so often. Um, we have found that there are just a lot of topics that intersect with real estate that aren't necessarily things that we are experts in, but want to learn more about, want to educate ourselves so we're um, more informed buyers and better neighbors to the, um, to the people that we eventually buy and live next to. Um, so we are so grateful you're here. I'm going to pass it off to Krista and, uh, and uh, Jonathan to get us started. If you want to stay on mute while you're here, and then if you have any questions uh, or comments as we go through the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat so everyone can see them. And then we will answer them at the end after the presentation, we'll kind of go back and do a Q&A. So thank you again for being here. Um, if you can't stay the whole time, we will be recording this and sending out a recap email. So no problem if you can't stay, but um, we would love to have you at the end for the Q&A. All right, I'm gonna pass off to our presenters. Hi, um, I'm Krista, and they are ace down of them. Hey, sorry, um, I'm Jonathan. I'm going to be the one navigating the slides, so if <laughs> miss up, it's going to be on me. <laughs> right. Um, I'm Krista. Use um, she, her pronouns. Um, I am a teacher and a curriculum spe specialist. Um, I have a master's in curriculum and instruction in early childhood education from UT. I've been doing education research and curriculum development for about 14, almost 14 years now. And I've been working in the Austin area on and off for about eight of those years. And Jonathan? Nice, so my name is Jonathan Salinas and my pronouns are he, him, his. So um, my background, I have a master's in instructional design and education technology. So all things tech related in the field of education is my area of interest. Um, I'm a former AISD school teacher. Um, I taught primary grades for over three years, specifically in bilingual classrooms in Austin, the Austin Independent School District. Um, before becoming a teacher, I also served uh, two years in the AmeriCorps program, which my particular program served um, underprivileged K through to um, students and I was in a sense a literacy tutor and mentor for them for two years and uh, that's what really sparked my interest in education and um, you know a knack for social justice and social um, service. So uh, this kind of webinar is something that's near and dear to both of our hearts and um, we invite this to invite this to be more of a collaborative experience. Um, obviously, we're going to give you our um, perspectives and our, you know, ideas and very interested to hear what you'll have to say at the end of this webinar. All right. So we're going to talk about a few discussion points and I'm going to just give you a brief overview of what they are. So the first one is what does a school, good school mean? Then we're gonna talk about the school systems in Austin. Then we're gonna talk about school rankings and websites and how they tie to real estate, specifically Zillow. Um, and then we're gonna talk about bilingual education here in Austin. And then we're gonna end the webinar with viewing school through a social justice lens. Alrighty, so a quote that we found, you know, that really helped inspire us and helped um, create the vision and help us focus the whole time was this quote right here. Good schools, like good societies and good families, celebrate and cherish diversity. A passion for learning isn't something you have to inspire with. It's something you have to keep from extinguishing. And then this will lead us into um, Krista, if you wanna talk about what does a good school mean? Right. So when we talk about good schools, you know, this is something that you hear a lot from parents and from people who are planning to be parents and just generally about education. 
um, lawmakers, everyone, they always want to make sure that we have good schools and what's our academic standing and how's our education. And when they talk about that, honestly, uh, there are like, four big things that um, people usually rank what a, what a good school or a bad school is. I'm going to use air quotes a lot, so get into it. <laughs> so one of them is test scores. Um, in Texas, those are um, the STAR test, and well, it, it evolves, but it's basically a standardized test that's given um, periodically throughout elementary, middle school, and high school. Um, and then obviously also when you're in high school, um, SAT and ACT scores. Uh, racial diversity, um, the Title I or reduced, reduced or um, free lunch students, how many um, are enrolled within a school. And then how many extracurricular programs and language programs that school offers. Uh, in Texas, that usually means football and Spanish, um, but also encompasses other things, soccer, band, theater, et cetera. Um, and oftentimes, like, the higher the test scores, the um, more extracurricular activities and the lower amount of racial diversity and the um, lower uh, amount of children who have Title I schools are, um, Title I students are what end up getting labeled um, a good school. Now, um, the term good school is coded language. It's racist to be perfectly frank. Um, what it, it, it ties so directly to how many white children are there and how many children of color. And we'll get into this in a little bit, but that often how many children of color are in a school ends up being directly related to how much funding a school gets. So you'll see that when parents are asking it, whether or not they intend it to be, and usually it is a bit of, um, particularly with white parents, um, they're, they're, they're really checking in on, on how white a school is. Um, and then Jonathan, did you wanna talk about the test scores? Right, so to piggyback off what Krista said, um, if you go to any AISD school landing page, um, particularly, we'll give my school, for example, where I worked at Graham Elementary. The landing page, the first thing you're going to see on that particular landing page is the STAR test scores for that past year. Um, oftentimes, this is the first, you know, interpretation without even seeing the school of what um, the parent thinks of that school. What, what do they score in reading? What do they score in math? What is the overall, you know, um, good sco scores um, at that school. So I think it's important that whenever we look at school landing pages or whenever we conceptualize the idea of a standardized test, that this is just a score taken at a moment in time and that doesn't reflect the student's, you know, current standing. I know as an elementary school teacher, we're very, very much pushed by the higher ups to, you know, teach the test. You hear a lot of that. You hear testing strategies. You hear, oh, well, well, my kid has to pass this test in order to go to the next grade. These are these surmountable goals and tasks that we put on our students that don't end up reflecting their true nature. And I think that's um, a common, you know, uh, that's a a universal um, understanding and it's actually evolving that now more and more parents are shying away from the reliance of standardized test scores. Um, and it's right. worth it's worth pointing out as well that standardized tests are developed by white middle class educators for using white middle class norms as the um, as like what children should know, not only speaking, you know, something mathematically, but a few years back, the STAR test, for example, um, had a math question about, you know, if, if two subways leave at the same time, you know, and this one's fat, traveling this fast, et cetera, um, and children struggled for enormously because Texas doesn't have subways, right? And even if you might know what a subway is that disconnects I me mean, culturally really stumps children in situations like that. That's, that. that's a really good point. And I think that also lends itself that the STAR test is not written through a social justice or a cultural lens. Um, me being a bilingual teacher, I found it very, very hard to prepare my students for questions like that. They, my students are native Spanish speakers and a lot of the questions, whether it be math or history or open-ended prompts in writing, a lot of them don't really lend themselves to be written in their culture. 
and what they see in their everyday life. So thanks for bringing that up, Krista. That's extremely important. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, so um, uh, my thing right here is, guess what, if you are a buyer, Welcome, uh, step up Spider-Man, you have power and you have privilege. So with great power comes great responsibility. Um, insert laugh track here. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, what does that mean? Well, um, if you're a, sorry, so if you're a school, if you're looking, what we see a lot of times is, is one is parents, you know, they'll, they'll ask or people who are planning on having children, you know, they ask, what's a good school? And, and, and that's a tricky question because again, for all the affirmation mentioned reasons, but then to come into that space, to buy it and be like, okay, well, I, I know what the school's about. I, I looked up the website. I looked up the test scores, et cetera, et cetera. You, you get this very narrow view. And a lot of times parents who are more affluent and again, specifically white parents will come into these schools, specifically schools that are predominantly children of color um, and say, ah, so they're not doing well with test scores or, oh, they don't have enough, you know, um, extracurriculars. Let me come in and provide those things, right? And people are willing to say, oh, okay, you've got the checkbook. Let's do that and cater to that. And that's not necessarily what a school needs or wants. And we really need to look at why those schools are disadvantaged in the first place and how you can use that buying power, the fact that you, that you are now in this neighborhood or in this school system to really invest in it instead of shying away or trying to put your children in schools elsewhere. Um, Jonathan, can you switch to the next slide? So we're gonna talk about this from a historical uh, perspective first. So if you look at the, um, these little gifts that are happening, that first one you see right there that's got the orange, those are um, what were in the 30s um, and 40s, predominantly African-American um, neighborhoods. And so when the city planners of Austin were like, ooh, okay, we've got to talk about like, where's the bad area of town or where's the good area of town? Watch that swipe. Those red squares match up pretty much perfectly. And at that point in time, there weren't um, higher crime statistics. There was nothing going on it. They just decided that must be the bad area of town because, uh, because black people live there. And that's literally how Austin's redlining pretty much still looks today. And so for those of you who are probably familiar with that term, it has a lot of political ramifications. And again, when it comes to schools, it means where does funding go? How do they get represented? Who's enrolled there? Class sizes and all of that gets swayed. And when you, and when, um, you buy into a neighborhood, you, you change that demographic, right? Which has pros and cons, but it often directly affects schools, whether or not you are an intend to, or whether or not you even plan on having children enrolled in that area. Um, so let's talk about something super fun, <laughs> which is called the 1928 Master Plan. Um, in Austin, uh, John, can you just that one? Um, I'm sorry, Chris, No, 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 it's okay. Um, sorry, got it. Yeah, so this is an actual thing. You can look it up. It is public record um, from the city of Austin and uh, Austin City Council. In 1928 um, and prior to that, there were a number of communities um, in Austin that were called freedmen communities where um, black freed Texans um, who had either for many reasons were, um, had, were no longer slaves and were allowed to buy property, created communities for themselves. Um, and they are communities, Clarksville, uh, you know, Wheatsville, right near Barton Springs and Zilker was one. Um, and those uh, communities were thriving. They had their own schools, grocery stores, churches. I mean, they were, they were really doing beautifully. Um, and then around the 20s, as you, you know, Jim Crow starts to grow in. And how that affected in Austin is the city suddenly saw that these were areas that were near beautiful pieces of land, like the, like the river, that were near downtown, that had space. And they decided that that couldn't exist anymore. And so what they decided was that they made up the 1928 master plan, which said in very 
separate but equal segregation as language, well, it costs too much money for us to have bathrooms and restaurants and provide social services that there is one, um, there are, are one for white people and then one for people of color. So what we're gonna do is ask everyone to move, everyone who's black to please move to the east side. And we're gonna build a highway there, which is I-35. Um, although I-35 didn't end up being completed until the 50s, the 50s, early 60s. Um, and so they moved everyone. And what they said was, if you don't move, the problem is we're putting all of our funding and for those public amenities onto the east side. So if you decide to stay in this community, you will no longer get plumbing, you won't get electricity, you won't get paved roads, police won't come help you, you're on your own. Because we're not putting money in two spots of Boston. And essentially tried to run um, the entire black population of Austin to the east side. Now, some of those communities stayed and fought. Clarksville, for those of you who are not familiar with where Clarksville is, it is on um, West 6th Street, right between, uh, like right there between Mopac and um, sort of where like that Amy's Ice Cream, Whole Foods, all of that is up a little bit more uh, north. So up until 1975, there were still places that sewage ran in the creek and didn't have paved roads. And then the city finally came in and did, and did something about that um, because there was an African-American community that refused to move. And of course, while the city decided and promised that there would be um, equal spending on schools and sidewalks and playgrounds on the east side, that never came to fruition, as we know is very common in segregationist societies. And so when you see these maps here in, in 1940, that purple is the density of, uh, a, um, of African Americans in Austin, the blue is the white population. And as you can see, the Latinx population began to grow in the 80s within Austin. Um, and now 2010, this is when that, this report was done, so I don't have a more recent image. You can really notice how things have changed. There are less and less communities of color and they're being pushed out further and further. And you see these large um, white spots which have become very industrial or um, business oriented like downtown. And the problem with this is very, is huge. And here's how it impacts education. If you are moving into an area and you've decided, well, this school isn't good because it's been underfunded and causes you know, generational issues forever and ever and ever, I don't want to put my kid in that school, right? And those schools, the way they get funding is based off of enrollment and property taxes and everything else. And so then these students um, are sent to charter schools or private schools or asked if they can be given vouchers or bused to different areas, right? And again, then it becomes less affordable for people who were in this neighborhood to go uh, to stay there. And all of you know that the CAT metro system, God bless it, does not go that far. Austin has terrible public transit. So the further you push people out, then the harder it is for them to be able to come into town and work and have jobs that are, <clears throat> more, that are higher paying, right? So this keeps perpetuating it and people have to have multiple jobs, which makes it harder for them to offer the same amount of um, support for their children. And they can't necessarily put their children into after school programs like soccer or sports, singing lessons that give them advantages in other ways. Because even if you can't afford it, it's hard to get to them physically, right? Um, and, and I just wanna take a moment, especially because Indigenous Peoples Day was Monday, to remember that this land is twice stolen. So all of this land belonged to the indigenous tribes of, the, of Texas, was stolen. And then, um, then once um, black Americans were, three black Americans were able to save up money, buy something for themselves and then create a community, it was stolen yet again. So when buying a home, and I am a homeowner and I did buy my house through um, Open House Austin, it's really important to be conscious of who are you displacing? Are we doing something a third time, right? What does that impact have? And if you are coming in, how can you negate that displacement? And education and the school system is a really good place to start. Um, so one of the other things is, um, there's a quick study and I'll, I'll probably use, that they found in multiple studies have found that white parents in particular will claim that they really want diversity. It's a big thing that parents claim they want in schools. They want diversity, they want difference. It's a buzzword. But then when given the opportunities of schools, overwhelmingly 
over 70% of white parents will choose schools where white children are the, are the largest percentage, right? Because for them, diversity, whether it's a conscious choice or not, means that you, it is a white setting where children of color now come versus a school that is predominantly children of color where white students come in. It's incredibly, it's still diverse, but you are now the minority, right? So there's a lot of assumptions that come in with that and a level of uncomfortability that white people often have. Um, okay, now to Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. That was, uh, you tested a lot of very good historical points and I think points that we need to be reminded of constantly, whether you're a renter or whether you're a homeowner. Um, I think it's the, it's the overall, you know, social justice lens of where am I now and where was this place um, in the past. So we're going to talk a little bit about school rankings, specifically um, looking up schools on websites and how oftentimes when homeowners or home buyers are looking at websites and they're using websites like Zillow and they're using a bunch of different um, fast realty sites. Oftentimes those sites have a descriptive part, an element of a school rating within the website. And they get that from the very controversial <laughs> greatschools.com. Um, so great schools has a really, really intense past of relying heavily one on standardized test scores and two relying heavily on how many white kids are at that school blatantly. Um, so oftentimes when, uh, I'm, let me preface, I'm a renter, I'm not a home buyer, but oftentimes when people are looking to go in, to buy a home, they ask people around, is this school a good school? So if they're talking to a realtor, they're not really going to get that answer from the realtor. They might get that answer from maybe a neighbor, or they might get that answer from a friend who lives there. So since realtors can't give that information, websites like Zillow and great schools step in. So they kind of like wash their hands um, in a sense. Um, realtors wash their hands of giving that information because Zillow is paired with great schools. Um, so about this. So great schools um, test scores account for 60% of the score that they give that campus. So say if my score is underperforming on the standardized test, 60% of that grade school, school score goes to that. And 10% goes up to um, about the diversity of that particular school. All right, so um, grade schools is privately run. Um, it's steering people towards wider and more affluent schools because of the rating system. Um, the root of the problem is, like I said, the reliance on standardized tests. So I looked today and Zillow is still paired with great schools. That descriptor is still on that website and great schools is still, you know, giving data that unfairly um, levels that campus based on their standardized test scores. So, you know, it's important to note when looking that you need to actually go into the school, actually talk to people in the community. I know that sounds like a no brainer, but in you know the realm of fast technology googling things i feel like we are relying more and more on websites and specifically school rankings i know i can speak from my experience as a teacher um predominantly my school was 80 percent latinx and we had probably about maybe 10 percent african-american um but the few white students that were in my classroom were new to the community. Their parents had bought um, a house there. So actually, let me give a geographic preference for my schools. We're Runberg and 35 Breaker Lane area. So a lot of those houses have been lived in by generationally the Hispanic community. Um, within the last three years there at my school, I saw a large influx of white students and um, Asian students. Um, this was great. Um, we were able to collaborate. We were able to learn through a different lens through their culture, um, which I'll talk about more is um, the bilingual aspect. 
but I slowly saw the culture of my school changed based on the new addition of students. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that um, was noticeable. Even my kids noticed it. So, um, uh, so yeah, so school rankings and websites are very important to, um, to look at those through a social justice lens. And I think it's important, I'm gonna piggyback off Jonathan, mm -hmm. it's important to know that just as a general rule, like a thing that uh, my real estate and open house, particularly Christina taught me, is that Zillow is not a good reference point. Even just for shopping for a house in general, people will search and be like, well, this is how much a house is in this area. And you're like, no, they kind of, they kind of catfish you with houses and everything like that. And again, the, this idea of telling you, plus laughing because she knows I'm right. Um, but again, it's that idea of like, we're promising you something because we think that this is what you are gonna want. And when you are unaware of what else is out there, especially when it's hard to dig, like if you're buying a house, you know, one of the best tips um, I also got was like knocking on the neighbor's doors and being like, hey, I have a, we have a creek. If I bought this house, what's the likelihood it'll flood, right? You know, like, and getting to know people. So it's the same thing if you're going to be trying to figure out like schools and community involvement. Oh, okay, so me again. <laughs> Sorry, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, All right, so this is a quote um, from a study that came out uh, this summer, 2020. Um, on average, white students in Travis County um, attend schools where 25% of the population is poor. Students in poverty make up 67% of the population at schools black students attend and 71% of the populations at schools Hispanic students attend. The gap in school poverty rates is the largest in the state. So basically, actually not basically, Travis County, the schools are the most segregated in the state of Texas. So, but by buying a house here, like that's just what you buy into, right? It is the most segregated in the state. Um, and I believe Austin is the only city that was for 2019 that was like on the fastest growing, most affluent and also most segregated lists at the same time. Um, again, because that was how it was designed thanks to the 1928 master plan, like this is its legacy, right? If you are going to physically separate children and defund that area, it takes a lifetime, multiple lifetimes to overcome that and change it. It's generational wealth, it's generational trauma. If you are telling people, you're know, holding them in a way that they can't succeed academically, you're not giving them the tools and support and you're not valuing the, what their community, what their culture can bring to the table um, and focusing on that and helping meet com the community where they are with the needs that they have, then again, low test scores means less funding, which means, you know, again, which means then you're still at a, and it, and it goes on and on and on. Um, and so again, one of the things that, um, and Jonathan can speak more to this in a minute, is when you are um, at a mixed income school. So for example, if you're buying in, on the, in the east side or um, in Jonathan's area, um, and actually the elementary school that's walking distance from my house is this as well, where you have a large percentage of students that are low income, Title I, um, and then a growing amount of population where the parents are up in, in middle or upper middle class and bringing more money in, it, it will change the dynamic of the school and it will change how the school gets, um, not only, it, it will change not only how the school gets funded by the city, but it changes how the school is able to buy things for themselves, right? Um, I know a few of you have already mentioned the uh, podcast, Nice White Parents, and you'll notice that if you've listened to that, there is an instance where parents come in and they're like, we want a French program, and they pour the money in for a French program. So those schools are, again, able to start affording things, but the white parents or the affluent parents are able to dictate where that money goes and the support that should, that should be provided, right? Um, without reflecting on what actual support, what actual needs are um, like the children needs are the lack of a better term, you know, and, and the community really values. Um, so for example, it is an anecdote, when my partner and I bought our home, um, Pillow Elementary is the school that's next to us. And, um, you know, he, he's British, he's not from here, so he doesn't, he didn't quite know how the school system worked. And he asked me, what well, is it a good school? And my response was, well, that's hard to say because how do you find that out? We, we don't know yet. What do we do? If you go to their website, 
they have a large Hispanic population, a large number of children are Title I, and the test scores aren't great. But if you go to community boards, if you talk to parents, overwhelmingly they love the school. There's 14 students to one teacher, which is a really low number, um, which means they get more attention. They talk about how it feels like family and they have a garden and it's, more community-based. So what you're seeing is that there's cultural representation. And the teachers and the administration are caring about how that child develops and what knowledge is offered and retained versus making sure that, as Jonathan said, they teach to a test. And that's something you really want to value, that, that there is genuine diversity and genuine support in that school. Um, because yes, so if you are flying into an, a school and you know that you're going to be there, or if you are just moving in, again, without having children, without sending, it impacts how segregated that school is because um, the more that white parents um, or white families buy into areas that are, that are traditionally or predominantly Black or Latinx neighborhoods in Austin, then things become, you think like, you're like, oh, it's going to be less segregated, but it actually just starts pushing people out more and more and more. But we say that like it's, we said that it's negative. It's actually something we can reverse. It's actually something that by people moving in, we can really make things better. So it's, then we're going to talk to you more about that, about how you really can impact in a very positive way. Um, um. All right. So now we got types of school systems in Austin. We're going to talk about three of them. And, you know, this is going to be a hybrid conversation between Chris and I. I'm going to give my perspective as a public school teacher and Krista will give her perspective as a private school teacher. Um, I do have to preface that any, there is no, that each of these three types of schools have their pros and cons. Um, especially on the east side, you're going to find, I'm sure as y'all know, more charter schools, more magnet schools, right? This is a push by the community to, you know, provide differentiated programs for um, for the people in the area. So from my experience, um, what you're going to find at charter schools is you're going to find a higher like one to one ratio of technology. You'll hear the word one to one a lot when talking about um, device usage per student. Um, you'll have a fully staffed school. Um, I know as a public school teacher, that's not something that we had any year at my campus, there was, there was a severe lack of understaffed um, teachers. And that just goes to more of a broader problem of not being able to hire bilingual teachers or teachers to work for public schools in general. Um, what I think is really important to note about charter schools that many of y'all may or may not know is that they have a more strict behavior policy. And by that, I mean they essentially have a strike system. So I can give you an example. So my students would leave my school at Graham Elementary and they would go right across 35 to um, IDEA. They would go there for a few years and then they would come back to my school. And you think about why, why, why are they back here at Graham? I thought they were so excited to go to IDEA, you know, the new one-to-one -one ratio, you know, all of the extra extended time that that school has. Um, Charter schools reserve the right to keep students there and not to keep students there. And essentially that kind of puts public schools as the back burner. Um, obviously, most schools have social emotional learning curriculum, SEL curriculum, which essentially helps um, students mitigate social um, feelings and behaviors. And But um, there is a, an overarching problem with charter schools policing the bodies of children of color, especially male children of color. And so they could be on the strike system and once they're out, they're back at their public school. And it, 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 it's a cycle and it's a cycle that hasn't changed. Um, moreover, the charter schools and I can, with, sorry, go for it. No, 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 go ahead. I'm, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that too. Because okay. And moreover, the charter schools act in a sense of a, in a sense of the way of a lottery system. So you apply and if they have a cap, your student gets put on the wait list. Um, that is a really big problem, specifically with my school, Graham Elementary and IDEA across the street. I would have students one year at my class and then the next year they would go to IDEA that they would come back just because one, they were in a sense kicked out for behavior or two, they didn't make it on the list and, and then they're back. Um, Chris, do you have anything you wanna talk about 
Yeah, so I taught at a charter school for a year, which not idea, it's, it was across I-35 from Jonathan School as well. Um, and it goes back to, again, I was paid the best I've ever been paid <laughs> as a teacher. Um, and that was, that was wonderful, I'm not gonna lie. But also the policing of black and brown bodies, specifically um, black boys was horrifying. Um, you would see like boys who, I, I had one boy, a young black boy in my, my class who, um, you know, we had, we met twice a week. I was a theater teacher there and he would, he would miss two weeks because they would put him in in-school suspension for small infractions. It's basically a zero tolerance policy. And I saw in one instance, um, he got suspended. I saw him after school and he was so enthusiastic. He loved being in theater. And he had a lot of energy. And honestly, he, I think he like maybe was disruptive in my class once. And it, it doesn't matter. He, he loved to be there. And you would see him get punished and other teachers being like, oh, well, he talks back all the time. So you have to put him in ISS, which means in school suspension. And then there was a, a little white girl who was in my class. And again, the majority of the school was um, Latinx with this, um, like probably 20% being African-American and then like a smattering of white students. She was caught cheating on the star test. She was a, a sixth grader. She got caught cheating. She got sent to the office. She was crying. And I'm, and I'm not saying she should have gotten like a, an incredibly harsh punishment. And then she got, she got told that that was disappointing and she'd have detention that day. She'd have detention that day. But this other student spoke up in class and got suspended, in school suspension for two weeks. And whether that is Absolutely, and it's not uncommon. There are a lot of studies that talk about the fact that black boys are punished or held at in-school suspension, particularly in charter schools, at twice to three times the rate of white students. And so that, and it does happen in public schools as well, but that is something to take into account um, if you're looking at a charter school. Um, okay. Uh, Jonathan, did you wanna do the next one or me? No, Chris, I was going to ask if you want to talk from a private school teacher perspective as well. I know you have also taught in right. private school as well. Yeah, so I've also taught in private schools. Predominantly, I teach in private um, uh, early childhood or like preschools, um, although I have also taught at, um, as a guest, like a guest teacher for a semester at a private high school in Dallas. Um, so the thing about teaching in the private schools is it's kind of what you think. It's overwhelmingly white. It's really well-funded. Um, and it's really removed from what the city or the community is like. Um, that tends to also be true. I've, I've, I've taught in and had experience with private schools in New York City as well, which is an incredibly diverse city. And the private schools um, will often be more diverse than you would say here in Austin or um, more inclusive. But again, it's and, and we know that they're incredible things about private school. Again, lower student-teacher ratios, which is amazing. Technology, it's amazing. You get a lot of times more nuanced curriculum. And if you are someone who wants a religious-based education, that's a, a great option for you if you because you can find private schools that focus solely on that or have that as the backbone. There's really positive things, and I'm not knocking them. But I will say, again, what you're seeing is you're seeing children being taken out of public schools in the communities that they're in and placed over in private schools and it causes even greater segregation. And so we, what we need to look about when, when teaching at a private school is again, is how, how do we make them, our classrooms, um, culturally sustaining and reflective of a world that these children do not experience. So for example, um, and I know one of my other te teachers from a private school is here, um, and so is, and she'll be familiar with is you'll you'll get Thanksgiving, which is coming up. You'll get a week where we talk about pilgrims and Native Americans, and then that's it. As if Indigenous people do not currently exist, as if they do not exist all across the world all year round, right? And as it you'll do, you might do um, a Day of the Dead, which is coming up, Dia de los Muertos, and you'll do that week, and that's it, right? So whiteness is being reinforced and centered in a lot of way simply because it's not being seen and 
that can be something that you really, really work at um, as a teacher. If you're and you have to be, but you have to be very dedicated. You have to really fight it, and lots of teachers are. But it's not something that's easy, and it's not necessarily something that the schools will always give you support to do. Right, Krista, and you know, to add on that actually brings me to this um, conversation I had comparing my experience as a public school teacher to my friend as a uh, her as a charter school teacher and the specifically AISD gives their teachers way more autonomy and by autonomy I mean they entrust their teachers to of course teach the curriculum but they're going to frame it on the community that's relevant within their school. Oftentimes, if you go to a charter or a private school, you're going to get standardized curriculum, you're going to get streamlined curriculum, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But from a teacher's perspective, if you give me more autonomy over my curriculum, odds are it's going to be way more potent and way more long lasting and meaningful for my particular demographic. I'm sure you can agree to that, Krista. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on. And talk about bilingual education. That's so, I love. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's something that um, I am passionate about talking and it's something that, um, you know, I have been in. Um, so they, we're going to talk about LOI and it's the language of instruction specifically within Austin ISD. So there's three language of instructions LOI. There's an early exit program, which is strictly just English immersion for the non-native English speaker. Um, so it's a really good idea to find out what your LOI is for that particular campus. And LOI is within charter schools and public schools. And then the second LOI would be a dual um, language program, which is a differentiated day, one English, one Spanish, with certain subjects like science and math being taught in English, while other subjects such as writing and reading being taught of the language of origins. And for my case, it was Spanish. And then there is a one-way program, which is strictly just a bilingual education. So for Austin ISD, a one-way is going to be Spanish. They're going to learn Spanish up until they can test at a level where they can, um, in a sense, exit out of English. So their start test will be in Spanish up until they achieve a tell pass. That's a um, language rating where they um, can bear as an efficient um, English speaker. So something when you're looking into a school is definitely find out the language of instruction. Um, so next we're going to talk about the topic of sending your English speaking student into a predominantly speaking a Spanish speaking dual language program. Um, I have had experiences with this. So my classroom teaching is a bilingual primary school classroom. So I am teaching all day, every day in Spanish. I'm teaching content in Spanish. Um, there are parents that have sent their non-Spanish speaking child to a bilingual education classroom because why not? I think, um, let me just preface that both English only speakers and Spanish only speakers can learn from each other in a room. They can benefit greatly from that. Um, something that I want to talk about is how hot multilingualism is, and especially in gentrifying areas where a parent's going to send their student who doesn't necessarily know the language into the classroom to be immersed in Spanish. And for me and from my experience, I had a hard time, you know, balancing translating for my non-Spanish speaking student and still trying to, you know, get my students who are Spanish speaking up to grade level, up, up to reading level, up to writing level. So it's this hard balance of, yes, I want to promote learning for all students, but at the same time, the students that are learning Spanish and need to be taught natively in their language aren't getting enough time because there are other um, time constraints. Um, so Yes, it's appealing. Yes, it's important, but it's something to consider. So if you're, obviously, this is my opinion, if you're going to be sending your non-Spanish speaking student into a dual language or one-way program, I think it's important that you be aware that there are students in that classroom that are Spanish speaking students only that need maybe a little bit more time. And you need to think, is my child going to take away from that extra time of learning? Um, it's it's a pretty hot topic and I, I'm gonna say there's no one right answer. 
Um, but that's just something that is becoming more and more relevant and more and more talked about within Austin ISD. And something that is good to remember or good to learn um, is that when in those situations, right, a, an English speaking student who is coming into a bilingual classroom um, or going to an immersion language program is seen as, the parents and the child are seen as driven and gifted and how great it is and how smart that child is for learning a second language, right? And they're rewarded and we want to give them that extra time and everything. Um, and parents want more updates. Whereas um, children who are, uh, have a different home language, and Texas again, it's usually Spanish, but um, who have a different home language are seen as deficient for not already speaking English, right? So you're like, oh, they're trying to catch up. We don't understand. They're not there yet. And it, well, actually they're both doing the same thing, right? It's, they're just doing the opposite of languages. They are both acquiring a second language and they both need that devotion and attention. And I will say further to, to Jonathan's point, I've, I've had the opposite experience where it's usually predominantly English speaking students with Spanish speakers coming in. Um, it, it is great that children want to be multilingual it's, and it's great that families really wanna pr promote that. But again, how you're promoting it, think about the resources that you were taking up and the level of amount of privilege that that comes with and how you are able to possibly disrupt that privilege within that classroom, within that school. Awesome, thanks Krista. Mm -hmm. Okay, here comes the, your, your can-do checklist. And this is for again, people who um, have children, don't have children. Um, it's really great for buyers, I'll say predominantly, but renters should really be thinking about it as well. Um, okay, so the very first thing is join. Join in. Join in. If you're a parent, join in the PTA. Um, if you're not, um, join in community organizations. Figure out what volunteer um, opportunities there are and really join in and be invested in that community. Because even if you are not a parent, the effect of children in education really affects Austin and it affects on a global on a global and a national scale, right? Because if you are helping to empower Black children and um, children of color, that really changes the way things in this country work. It, it drastically changes things, you know? Um, and, and putting that effort and that power in, right? Um, the next one is listen. So when you join these organizations, before you jump in, before you do suggestions, just listen. Just hear what the school board, I mean, voting in local elections, right? Like research your, who's running for the school board this year. Um, but again, it's, it's who listen, listen to what the community says it needs, listen to what the community is saying it wants or it loves, right? Um, and, and make sure that you're attuned to that and not just jumping in and saying like, oh, again, like we we're talking about, oh, I see that there are low test scores or I see that there's not this um, there's not an after like a sports team. Let's add that, right? Listen to what the actual needs and desires and wants of a community are. Um, and then ask, ask, how can I help? Ask, what is it that you need me to do? What is it that you want? What is it that we can, we can work together? How can we create something, right? Make sure you ask a lot of questions and understand as best you can, right? The situation that, that your community and that your school system is in. Um, because it sounds super corny, but it's super true, is like investing in your, our children is investing in our future. And it's very, I mean, if you are walking around and you are talking and using the hashtag Black Lives Matter, again, the way that children of color and Black students in particular are treated in this country and treated in Austin, which is so segregated, really needs everyone's help to change that narrative. Um, offer, offer to help. Offer your skill sets. If, um, if you are someone who's great at social media, offer to do that. Offer to volunteer, offer to you know, sit at that raffle table if that's what they need. Um, you know, my, again, my pillow will like send out a thing to everyone in the neighborhood and be like, we're gonna have a 4th of July parade or a Halloween parade and be like, we need grownups to like stand on corners and things like that. Offer, you know? Um, if you have any kind of those skills, just like offer up what your time and your skill set. It's really important and really, really useful. And even if people say, no, we don't need you right now, just continue to offer because at some point there will be something that you can do. 
And the last one is money, which I did separate. We, we took offer and took, um, money separately for two reasons. One, if you are buying a home, you are um, putting in money into that house. You are able to financially invest in that neighborhood in real estate. Whether or not you're buying it as a rental property and you're gonna house hack or whether you're gonna buy it for you to live in and grow your family in, or you know, be awesome with a, with, a, with a dog and a lot of travel, it doesn't matter, you're investing financially. So make sure that you are able to also then invest financially in other aspects of the community. How can you support in small ways and big ways with your wallet? And remember that when you're donating, that comes without strings. You don't get to give the money and then make demands and say, I'm giving you this money, we're setting up a French program. If the school is saying, we need balls, we need art supplies, we need, um, we now, or we want a French te teacher, then give that money, right? Make sure that that comes as a gift and a way of that your, your children and, and your community are really supported. Um, and also, one of the great things, again, these are all, these are all things that I like to talk about because we see this like social change that we want to happen in Austin and in America, and it feels massive. And it is, it's huge. And these are ways that we can change that are small steps that have a huge impact, right? And, and they're really fabulous ways that you can give up a couple hours on a weekend or, you know, or, or once a month or, or, you know, weekly, it doesn't matter, but you're able to really be there and be present. Um, and again, remembering that if you are investing um, in a community and in a school, you're investing for the long haul. It's not just for while your child is there. You're putting your child in this school, you're having a faith and a belief that these teachers and yourself in this community are going to do the best that they can for this student while they're there. And while I'm not saying serve on the PTA when your child's in high school and not at this elementary school, just remember that you're setting up a legacy. And so that the things that you're doing are gonna be something that help for a long time and not just for right now to serve your child. Yeah. All right, and so this is our uh, ending slide. Um, so hopefully through this presentation, you have a you know, it solidified your interpretation of what a good school is, or it in fact changed your interpretation of what a good school is. Um, I think there were a lot of topics that Chris and I were bouncing back and forth. This is such um, a broad topic of a good school, and there's there's more that we wanted to add, but for time's sake, um, we didn't add it. So I guess this is now a good segue into you know a Q and A, and maybe we can talk about some of that content that we weren't able to get to, or answer some of your questions in a sense. Um, but again, so our our answer to what is a good school is a school where you and the community are invested in the success of the students without hegemony. Uh, hegemony, sorry. So back you want to explain what hegemony is, Chris? So that's a pretty big word. <laughs> Oh yeah, hegemony is um, when you consider, um, what, hegemony is when everything is basically the same, like homogenous basically. Um, there's a lack of diversity and that you are supporting the mainstream and the, um, and the base goal, right? So Congress is pretty, uh, has a lot of <laughs> hegemony, right? Because it's, it's a lot of old white guys, right? And so, and then those rules and those laws keep being supported the same way. So you toward the, that demographic, right? And we're trying to say, well, actually we're invested in like larger amounts of culture and larger amounts of students. And we want it to, to really look the way that our community looks and the way that we want our community in the future to look. All right. Um, thank you guys so much. That was incredible. And I, before I was involved with Open House, had a brief, career in nonprofits and, and actually worked um, in a nonprofit in, in a charter school and just kind of had like a rush of remembering all the, all the things. <laughs> and um, I just want to say thank you guys so much for your time. And I'll um, let, if you want to, it looks like uh, Christina has a question in the chat, but um, if anyone would like to um, unmute themselves and ask live, you can also do that too. So, um, so Christina's question is, that this was so helpful as a realtor we are asked where the best schools are a lot what would you say to that 
Um, <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to take it or do you want me to? Because I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so right. Um, I think from my perspective, I think it's important to direct that question. It, it's important to, you know, push those people to investigate the people like the, the restaurants out that area, the community centers, the library, have, have them get their answer through exploration rather than one person, if that makes sense. Um, my answer to that is um, the best school is where you buy. Um, where you buy that house, you make that the best school, right? You, you make that the best school. And I don't mean like, let's pretend, like, I mean, you, your child is there or you wanna have children there or you're however you want, like help make that the best school it can be. Cause what it's ma maximum right now is it's, you know, it's doing the best that it can with the resources it has. So you coming in just makes it better because you're gonna come in, because you came to this, you're gonna come in with a very different mindset and help increase that school. Um, Jennifer asks, uh, where are the resources we could provide for accurate data on funding, diversity programs, et cetera? I'm a little confused by your question, Jennifer, you're saying we, what resources or where are there lists that there are of resources you could do? I think like opposed to great schools or where would we go for more direct, is it just individual school websites or is there like a, a better database that has more accurate information? You know, that's, that's a good I'm going to say you're going to find way more information by following that school specific Twitter or that school specific site. Um, I think definitely steer away from landing pages that just give you raw data. I think um, investigate within the social media of that school. That's where you're going to, you know, get the most bang for your buck in a sense. Mm -hmm. I and yeah and again if you google a school like the first thing that will pop up is its school web page but oftentimes there are things like um Yelp pages and things like that like genuinely and you'll see that a lot of parents um will talk about the schools there um so that's like a good place to really see if that's like a um as a as an educator one of the things that I I often look for um when applying this like teach at places and also be there is again um, is I look to see like how the families feel about that school because I don't want to go into a place where they're like oh they treated my children poorly and kind of like well or if I go in there I want to be able to like know what that amount of like impact is that I could have. Mm -hmm. um, okay what it, um, all right there are a bunch of this is um, where should non-parent community members find groups to volunteer for? Um, Interesting. So I, I, I can give like at my particular school, Graham Elementary. So um, my librarian actually brought Camp Gladiator um, as an after school program for the teachers there. That's how it initially started, right? And so um, the school, so every AISD school has a parent support specialist. Um, and so that parent support specialist reached out to the coach at Camp Gladiator and, you know, formed that bond. Um, and so the Camp Gladiator attendees from the community came in on certain days. Obviously, this was before the pandemic um, and helped one on one tutor pull out students. They helped, you know, reshelf books in the library. They helped out with book fair and they helped out with um, our community events. So I think um, from my experience, the easiest way is if you're in an organization, try to you know reach out to that parent support specialist in the Austin ISD schools and see if there's any way that your organization or your um, group or team can you know do boots on the ground work at that school. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with what Jonathan's saying. Also, um, the way that I got involved with the um, volunteer group I'm doing um, right now, I. Literally, there's a director of equity for AISD, and I just emailed her. I just like straight up emailed and said, hi, my name's Krista, I want to help. I, and she was like, do you need to be paid? And I was like, nope. And she was like, great. And she said, okay, I'm going to send you, I'm going to CC like this person who is the head of ECE, uh, early childhood, and this person who's head of curriculum. And I'm going to email, and, I'm, and then they were like, oh, we know this program, and they really need tutors right now. And now I am again an educator, but they are taking on people who are not educators, um, as long as you go through like a training program with them. Um, and so that's something, honestly, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is always, there are nonprofits, if you, 
and, and community groups that are always like, we need someone to do this. And it will say unpaid, like at the top. And so that's always a really good resource, I think. Um, next door, as problematic as it can be in a lot of other areas, um, I think one of the things that is great about it um, is in the past two neighborhoods, Hyde Park and where I currently live, which is Shoal Creek, um, that I'm able to do is you're able to just be like, hey, does anybody know of like, um, like when the schools were going back or not going back rather, and they were talking, people were like, hey, does anybody know like um, how we could help students? Or like, does anybody know how we could like um, donate iPads or, or, or things like that? So really, again, like just, cause that's a straight asking of your community, right? Everybody can be on next door. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that those are some really good resources. And you can Google th them a lot too, or um, even, and again, non-parents, I'm trying to give you non-parent things, but non-parent is, um, because I am not a parent and neither is Jonathan. Um, but again, you can um, email, emailing your local PTA, which you can find on websites and things like that and saying like, hey, I'm not a parent, but like, I wanna help support. Like people will get back to you because education is really um, hungry for, for help in a lot of different ways. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to also do a shout out for Communities and Schools, which is the yes. um, nonprofit that we are using ticket sales to benefit, um, only because I have personal experience with them, but they are a nonprofit that has um, social service support on each campus. So you can work either as a tutor or a mentor. Um, obviously there's a training and background check and everything like that, but you get assigned to a student or a group of students and you meet with them once a week or they have, you know, different schedules, but you work privately with that student to like tutor them and just form, a, you know, have an extra caring adult in their life. And it's a really, really awesome program. It's like the most micro scale you can work with just an individual student, but um, it's an, it's an incredible program. So. Yeah. Um, and I would say, sorry, also the, um, the one that I, the one that I am working with currently is called Victor Tutorial Program. I'll write it in the bottom as well. And they are right now like AISD specifically partnered with them to help students have one on. Oh, campus. victory tutoring. Yes. Yeah. 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 The woman who runs it works for AISD. Her name is Karina Norega. And they are specific. AISD grabbed them and was like, please help us with the fact that we're having to do virtual learning. Yeah. And so they're doing great things like in the public library, students who can't physically be in school, but parents need to work, you know, can't do at home like taking public libraries and being like, here's your pod, libraries shut down to the public and then people can come in. Right. Inter up. Interestingly enough, the, so it was two years ago, um, my parent support specialist at my school was referring victory tutoring services to a lot of the parents and they had a long wait list. So that means that they didn't, like what Chris is saying, didn't have enough support and community help. Um, from a monetary perspective, I think I myself and a lot of teachers at my campus use Donors Choose. Um, I was able to get flexible seating and the art teacher does it every year. Um, so that is also something to consider. Donors Choose, um, you can help any school in any state. Um, I think it's a pretty powerful yeah. way to give. GoFundMe um in my yeah. uh, i'll put it up i put it up in my my private but i'll put it up on my, my public education one go find me right now there are what's called equity pods because again as we were speaking um so many like doing pods right now during covid for those of you who are unfamiliar is when families are able to stay at like home or hire a teacher or a tutor to come do in-person stuff with their students but again that's affluence and that's like oh we can have someone here and so there are things popping up now called equity pods, which are um, teachers who are working for free or for very little, helping low-income students, which again, predominantly Black and Latinx students um, here in Texas, um, like be able to support them and give them that same attention and that same support. Um, and But they need funding and they've got GoFundMes as well. Yeah. Are you guys familiar? I think I'm trying to think of the name, but they have kind of a GoFundMe thing, but like teachers specifically have like wish lists or Amazon wish lists that they have for their classroom or for their programs. Is there like a, I feel like there's a name for it. I have to look more into it, but that's like a good way to just like, you're already on Amazon, you're already buying things, you can send right. them, like you ship it right to them. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good one as well. Um, and again, like teachers, their work email is, and like the principals and everything are on that website. So again, yeah, saying, the, that's the one time to go to the landing page. Just to look yeah, 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 contact info. Or, uh, or the phone numbers, address and things like that. Because like, for <laughs> right. example, my um, elementary school or the elementary school that 
uh, is near me and I don't, I don't teach there. Um, they have a community garden. And so something that they've now been put up is like, they put up these signs that are like, um, vote on Instagram or come vote on this, which is like, how do you want our, um, our little park that's, that's part of the school and their community garden to look. And so they've got three choices. It's like wildflowers or pollinators or whatever. And then you can vote as a person in the community, which is great. And then once you vote, you're able to be like, oh, here's how I'll, I'll help. Um, I'll come out and I'll help plant things. Or I can, you know, I have a tiller or a wheelbarrow. Like, how can you like get in there and support? It's great to use your voice and then follow up again, like we said, with actions. I love that. Um, anyone else have a question? Feel free to type it. Or if you want to unmute yourself, we're open to it. Oh yes, Francesca just put the smile.amazon.com. That's like basically the same Amazon site, but uh, um, they take a portion of your order total and, and donate it. So oh, great. And I would say also like, feel free to support Amazon then. <laughs> that's true. You're gonna it do it. It is a really good resource sometimes, yeah. That's fair. Right. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, I am going to let you guys get on with your night. Thank you again, Kristen and Jonathan. This was incredible. We are so appreciative of your time and your knowledge. Looks like everyone really learned a lot. And again, we will have this recorded um, and share it again later. So if you want to go back and re-listen to it and I'll compile those kind of resources we talked about and um, send those out as well. So thank you so much for being involved. We are so excited for the next one. And um, yeah, have a good night, everyone. All right. Good night. Thank you, thank you for having us. Of Bye course. Thank you.